Hello, everyone. Welcome. Wednesday night, right here in the control room. Good to see you. Just so much exciting stuff happening. It, I mean, it seems really serene. You, you, you know, just a big black wall behind me, and I'm sitting here. Um, but we have our praise team over in the fellowship hall. They're practicing. We're still really working at figuring out this new system that we've got. And it's a great system. Uh, but there's a learning curve. Thank you for your patience. A lot of stuff you, you might not even necessarily see or, or, or know that's going on. But, man, Sunday morning was uh, Sunday morning was some kind of uh, exciting, uh, <laughs> getting everything ready to go. So just a lot of stuff. We, we have a proby um, in the room with us tonight. And uh, we are slowly beginning to pull people in to um, see what their aptitude is for dealing with this kind of stuff. Uh, so Russell, my buddy Russell's here. Russell, how are you? I'm excellent. How yeah, are you? I'm good. It's always good to see Russell. He's the steady hand. And then our probie tonight is, um, do you not want to say who you are? Okay. Andrew said not to tell you her name. And um, <laughs> so she's in here uh, pushing buttons tonight. And we appreciate that. <laughs> so there you go. Um, and so while I'm sitting here in this room and, and we're spending this time together, the monitors... Uh, for the camera system are on in the fellowship hall, so I can actually sit here while I'm talking to you and out of the corner of my eye, both eyes, you can see our praise team in there hard at work and going on, so it's just really interesting. So welcome. I'm glad that you decided that it was important enough, enough of a priority to stop whatever you had to stop, to sit down, pull back, slow down, we talked about Sunday morning, and just spend a little time on this, on, it, on, on this street corner, this cyber street corner, for some fellowship, some prayer, some Bible study. Um, if there's if there's one thing that really concerns me related to um, the coronavirus and uh, kind of its a, its impact on churches in general, on, on our church as well, is that um, because we can go back and watch the recording of a service at a convenient time. Um, it's been a lot easier for us to not discipline ourselves to be ready for church at 7 o'clock on Wednesday night or at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning or whatever it might be. And uh, it's just something we have to recognize by, about ourselves and and, uh, and deal with that. So, okay, let me make some announcements, some stuff going on. Association of Bible Drill this Sunday, uh, 4.30, Fellowship Hall. As uh, our children and students continue to move through the process, this is the associational drill, and then they'll... Uh, hopefully, uh, many, if not all of them, will be able to continue on uh, to the next level. The associational drill is the final level for the children. Is that right? And then it's the students who go on into... No, state children have stayed, too. Children have stayed, and then the students have... Yeah, okay. So, um, all that good stuff... I was giving Andrea an opportunity to get her voice uh, on air, but she whispered the whole time. So anyway, okay, on March the 18th, which is a Thursday, Thursday, a week from tomorrow, uh, our Legacy Builders Bible Study. It'll be from 10 o'clock to 11.30 in the Fellowship Hall. They're going to be doing a pretty cool study. I remember when several weeks ago when uh, Clyde kind of sat down with me and, and told me what he was doing. He's doing a study called The Gates of Jerusalem. He's just looking at the different gates in the in the walls around Jerusalem um, and their meanings. Um, so anyway, that's on uh, a week from tomorrow. Uh, Legacy Builders Bible Study, 10 to 11.30 in the Fellowship Hall. If you need more information, call Clyde or Jan, please. Deacons meeting. Uh, Deacons will not be meeting this Sunday, but we're all going to meet on uh, March the 28th at 4.30 in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, there are... There are a couple of uh, recommendations that are coming through uh, our committees that will then go on to the church uh, if, if they are, are approved and um, affirmed by our deacons. And that deacons meeting will be on the 28th. So you'll be reminded of that. You don't have to worry about remembering that. We'll get some more information out to you. All right, here's something I'm not sure whether to be excited about, nervous about. I don't know. Um, the current COVID guidelines under which we're trying to operate as much as possible, and we're not, we're not, we're not trying to be pharisaical in terms of letter of the law, but we are trying to honor as much as we can. Um, the current guidelines run out 
as it stands right now on Monday, March the 15th. We are that close to uh, that. I'm, I fully expect our governor will be putting out some kind of update, maybe lessening some of the restrictions, or uh, I, I don't know what he's going to do. Um, if you follow the news, you'll know that several states, several governors have actually lifted all their COVID restrictions. I don't know that ours is going to do that. But as it stands, like right now, on this Wednesday night as we're together, there are no new COVID guidelines beyond Monday. And um, so we'll see how that shakes down. Maybe by Sunday we'll have a clearer word. But we were talking today, Andrew and I, um, we talked to staff meeting. I mean, we, we pretty much are ready to go on just a couple of days' notice with things like our Wednesday night ministries related to children's ministry and student ministry and even our fellowship dinner on Wednesday nights. Uh, Janice is, is ready to go. We've, we've got a, or we will have a menu in place, I think, tomorrow. And uh, we're probably going to go ahead and order the food for that first menu so that uh, we'll be good to go on that. So it's kind of exciting, a little bit of uh, anxiety, and just in terms of wondering what's going to come. And I checked it. I checked the governor's website about 10 minutes before I came in here, and there had been no update at that point. So anyway, that's just some stuff. Y'all are probably keeping up with it uh, as well as I am. Okay, so... Um, the last announcement, we're actually going to kind of introduce it by way of, or make it by way of video. I think, I think sometimes it's good when you need to get information out and you want to get out in a way that kind of sticks with people in their memory. And so uh, we have a little video here we put together just to remind you of, of our final announcement. And you're fixing to watch that right now. So you just, here we go. One, two, three. What is going on in there? Oh man, you just missed the pyrotechnics. And the choreographed number by the choir, hashtag amazing. This has got to be the greatest thing that I've ever seen <laughs> anywhere. I mean, I'm on my third Kleenex, bro. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm sure they're going to put it on the Facebook page soon. Right. What? Facebook? No! No, you know what? That is what's wrong with this church. The Facebook page? No, 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 I'm talking about the Facebook. I'm talking about the sheer fact that I've been coming to this church for years. For years! And the service times have always started the exact same time for years. And then all of a sudden, out of left field, they want to change that. Did they consult anybody? No, they did not. Did they stand up there and ask the congregation, hey congregation, what do you think about this? No, they did not. I didn't vote for this. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna march in there, and I'm gonna release the Kraken on the pastor, and then I'm gonna go find another church. Wait, 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 wait. What are you doing? Why didn't you just tell him it's daylight savings time? And miss this? Yeah. Which camera we're going to win? All right. Good. Hey, everybody out there, right here. This is for Andrea. She did all that. She did a great job. She did. And it's nerve wracking getting to Andrea. It is. There it is. There she found her voice. So uh, that's really good. So that's a little video reminder that this is the weekend when we step into daylight savings time, which means we spring ahead. Yes, for some people, they interpret that to mean we lose an hour of sleep. And I guess in one way of thinking, that's true. But and it's just a fun video there. But I hope you'll make that uh, adjustment. If you use... Uh, really a halfway modern watch or clock or phone uh, those phones will set themselves automatically so there you go all right prayer list i've got mine right here yours have been sent out uh, electronically and there are a lot of, a lot of names on here on the prayer list and i'm just going to highlight some of them and uh, ask you to be in prayer uh, for these people um, this this is a great this prayer list is a great way to Organize your prayer time as far as your inter intercessory prayer. You know, maybe, you know, praying for for the people in this block on Monday and people down here on Tuesday, however you want to do it. But that's why we 
uh, print this, but let me do, let me call out some things. Uh, Diane Garner, uh, better known to most people around here as G, is still in the hospital. I think she's still on the vent. They're, they're trying to get some more fluid off of her heart before they pull her off of that. Um, pray for her. Um, she's, she's one tough lady and, um, I'm looking forward to pull through this, but let's pray for her. They're in the hospital. Faith Steely uh, is in the hospital in Fairview. Pray for her. Um, Kristen Lane. Um, Jean Tapley is uh, still at uh, Navicent. Uh, pray for Jean. Pray for Miss Betty and things going on with him. Austin Rogers. Austin, I don't know if you're watching or listening or able to down in Florida, but just want you to know we're praying for you, thinking about you. I think the whole family is down there or at least mom and dad in Austin are down there. And uh, praying that all goes well. He's fixing to have, do you know, Andrew, do you know it was a surgery? I don't remember the date. Sometime this week. And it's going to be that kind of thing where he's going to have to lay flat for seven days. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, pray, pray for Austin and pray for uh, his parents down there. Uh, pray for Patricia Dykes, uh, some things that she's, uh, kind of haven't checked out medically speaking I had an endoscopy I think today and um, so keep her in your prayers Zeke Barker, Greg Gay uh, pray for them they're in our extended family list I um, also want to miss, mention uh, Ashley Herndon's extended family pray pray for uh, Ashley Herndon's extended family and um, what not and so you know uh, Danette has just let us know, hey, they're listening from home because the surgery is not till the 24th of uh, March. And so they're still in Cochrane. Hey. <laughs> so I take back all that stuff about those prayers. Okay, just just hold on to that. And uh, that's coming up. I don't, know, I don't know how I missed that so bad. I'm not paying attention. That's on me because it says 324 right there on the prayer list. Oh, well. Um. Zeke Barker, Greg Gay, Ashley Herndon's family, um, pretty emotional thing that they're going through. Ashley wants you to know that we're praying for you if you're watching tonight. And then we got some baby news. Uh, JC and Morgan White, and I'm not heard. Uh, this is their due month. So uh, I pray for them as uh, baby number two is on the way. Brett and Allie Bowen are expecting another child. That's exciting news. And I'm just thinking Jackie and Laura Bowen might be excited about that. Don't know for certain, but I'm guessing so. And also Justin and Lindsay Drew are expecting a baby. And Jesse and Kathy Peavy, the grandparents, I'm sure are really excited about that. So just a lot of different things going on. Uh, you got people that uh, are getting their vaccinations and they're finding a bit of confidence for coming out back into the big wide world of germs and viruses, and that's an exciting thing. I saw some people at church Sunday. It's the first time I've seen them in church probably in a year uh, since when we stopped. And it has been, this Sunday will this Sunday will be the one-year anniversary of our, the final service before the coronavirus restrictions hit, and which is an amazing thing. Um, still want to be safe. Don't want to be foolish. Uh, just, you know, Walk quietly, walk safely, uh, walk in the wisdom of the Lord, and and um, pray for each other. Be encouraged. Let me encourage you to read your newsletter uh, this week. The, the article I put in is a great story I came across. Uh, it's a great reminder to us of, of our calling as brothers and sisters in Christ, not just within our church, within our community, and how, how we can do some things there to encourage one another. So let me lead us in a prayer, and we're going to look at what the Bible says to us tonight. Father, we come to you in the name of of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, as we approach Easter, we, we, just, we need you to remind us of how desperately we need the cross. Father, remind us that there was no hope for any of us until you sent Jesus into this world. That there was no salvation until you sent Christ. And we thank you for that. And Father, we, we look into your holiness and we 
we're embarrassed, we're ashamed at the depth of our, our sin, the stain of our sin. And we're sad that the cost was so high that it required Jesus leaving his home in eternity and coming to walk this earth to carry our pain on his own shoulders onto the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. He who never knew sin became sin for us. Father, that's, that's why Easter just blows us away. But in that way that you do things, Father, even as, even as our hearts break over the awful price that was required for our sin, to pay the debt of our sin, we are filled with incredible joy and love and wonder at a God who loves us so much. Father, thank you for making a way, the only way, for us to come home to you. Father, during this Easter season, these weeks ahead of us, just, Father, would you remind us in a fresh way, powerful way, every day, of your presence in our lives, your presence in our world, your purposes, your plans, your sovereignty. God, the, the names that are on our prayer list, some we've called out loud, some we have not. Father, we, we lift all those to you. We, we don't even know how to pray in a lot of these instances, in a lot of these circumstances. But Father, we trust you with the details of each one. We ask you to be in a, at work in a way that brings great honor and glory uh, to you. And now we thank for the privilege of studying your Holy Scripture. And Father, we, we, we need to confess, I need to confess, that we, we don't, we don't have the tools to dig life-changing truth out of Scripture. Father, that's, that's what you do by your Holy Spirit. You take your word and bring it to life in us. And so, Father, we need you by your Holy Spirit to be our teacher. Father, speak to each one of our hearts. We're all in different places in our journey and different things going on, and yet you can speak to every one of us tonight through Scripture. So we surrender to your, your teaching, to your guidance, to your revelation. And Father, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. So I'll put my prayer list down there so I don't accidentally knock it off the table. All right, we're going to look at, uh, tonight we're going to look at a um, parable. I love, I, I just love studying the parables. And, you know, a parable if I, if I can use this analogy, in, in many ways, a parable, uh, when, when you really start digging down into the truth of a parable, the applications, it's kind of like peeling an onion. You don't, you, you buy an onion, you just start peeling layers and, and layers, and then you get in deeper and deeper in that, the, the, of course, the onion gets stronger and stronger the closer you get to the center of it, but parables are like that. They, they can speak to us in so many different ways. Um, so we're going to look at one. Okay, it's in Mark chapter 4. If you have your Bible, electronic device, whatever you use for Scripture, um, I'm going to ask you to get it out right there where you are. We're going to be in Mark chapter 4. And this is just a little um, uh, three-verse, three um, four-verse parable. And this, is, this parable is only found in the Gospel of Mark. This is not one that is common to Matthew and also to uh, Luke or to John. This, this is the only place in the Gospels you find this short parable. And the interesting thing is that earlier in this same chapter, in chapter 4, Jesus has already told the parable of the seed that falls on rocky ground and shallow ground and kind of explained that to the disciples. And, you know, that, that one is common to some of the Gospels. But then after that, a little bit later, we come to this one. And so Mark 4, 26, if you have your scripture, you can just pick it right up there with me. Jesus also said, so he's teaching in parables here. And he begins, this one, he begins it this way. The kingdom of God is like. 
Okay, I'm gonna stop right there real quick. Just such a short parable, I can I can afford to stop a couple of times. Okay, anytime you hear Jesus beginning to teach and he leads with the kingdom of God is like, you need to sit up a little bit straighter and say, I need to hear this. Because this is gonna be a parable just like every other kingdom of God is like parable that's got um, eternal meaning and it's got here and now meaning for us and it teaches us about how we are involved in the kingdom or in God's kingdom here on earth. And I mean, there's just always so much in here. So this is one of those where Jesus is trying to help us understand what it means that we are members of the kingdom of God here on earth and how that works. So the kingdom of God is like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground. Like I said, and he's already talked about one farmer scattering seed and the different kind of ground it falls on. But, but now we come to this really short parable. And Jesus says, look, kingdom of God's like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground. Now, understand that you, you look at parables in a lot of different ways. And, and none of them are necessarily wrong. Um, sometimes when we read this, we might think, okay, so the farmer is God. Well, no, not really, not in this parable. The farmer is more like me and you because it says in the next verse, night and day while he's asleep or awake, the seed sprouts and grows, but he does not understand how it happens. Well, obviously, God understands how seeds grow. So, you know, there's a sense that God's kind of drawing us into the parable ourselves, saying this is your involvement with me in the kingdom of God, all right? As a matter of fact, this part right here is really the only it is everything else is predicated on what he says right here. The kingdom of God is like a farmer who's scattering seed. So this is our great calling in life. All right, here you go. We're supposed to be seed scatterers. We're, we are to be sharing the gospel of Christ. That's the seed, the seed of the gospel of Christ. Just spread it every chance we get, whether it's in the cyber world, whether it's in a small group. Andrew, you had a small group earlier tonight. Um, is Janet? Janet and Nancy. But that was a different one. So I had two small groups meeting tonight and spreading the word. And uh, this afternoon at 3.15, I was in the outfield grass out at the high school spreading the seeds of the gospel as I, I did chapel with our high school baseball team. And, uh, and so, so it's always, this is our calling to go into the world and be light, be salt, be seed scattering kind of people. Okay, let's go back to scripture. The kingdom of God is like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, while he's asleep or awake, the seed sprouts and it grows. But he doesn't understand how it happens. That's such an interesting thing. And it reminds us of who, who actually causes the growth of the kingdom of God on earth. All right. So in this parable, he's saying the farmer's throwing seed out. He doesn't even have a clue what happens once that seed's out there and it's in the ground. The earth produces the crops. This is verse 28. On its own. First a leaf blade pushes through and then the heads of wheat are formed and finally the grain ripens. And as soon as the grain is ready, the farmer comes and he harvests it with a sickle for the harvest time has come. Um, so uh, that's from the New Living Translations version of Scripture. And um, just in case maybe you're reading along there and wondering, I just I chose that version um, with, with great intent tonight. So, there you go. That's a really short parable. Jesus starts out, this, this is what the kingdom of God is like, okay? It's like you, the farmer. You're scattering seed. And you're going to bed, and you're getting up, and you're going about life. But while you're going about life, that seed is in the ground, and something's happening to it. It's growing. It's the life inside of it is coming out. And you don't even understand how that happens because the life was in the seed. Why didn't your scattering? It was in the seed, the, the, the power. The Apostle Paul talks about it in Romans, so I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of salvation uh, unto man. And then that seed begins to sprout and it grows. And, and, and then you see a little bit of green growth in the heads of wheat, and you see it starting to form and maturing, and the grain ripens, and then there's a harvest afterwards. And that's the end of that parable. That's it. Just four little verses right there. And um, so I, I want to talk to you about this parable. I want to make a couple of applications if I can. So some things I think we need to be reminded of. 
not just tonight, but on a regular basis, okay? The, the first thing I, I think we need to be reminded of is the fact that uh, you and I are helpless. I mean, we really are helpless to grow God's kingdom. A lot of times we think about us growing the kingdom of God. We, we can't do that. All we can do is plant the seed. All we can do is share the gospel of Christ faithfully. We can discover things. We can rearrange things, humanity. We can develop things, but we cannot create life. That is, that is not us. Um, man does not possess the secret of life. And we certainly don't, we don't possess the power or the secret of the, of, of the gospel and how it takes root in a person's heart, sometimes overnight, sometimes over a long period of time, but it is at work. It is alive. It's, it's, the, it's powered by the presence and the holiness and the Holy Spirit of God. We, we don't create the kingdom of God. The kingdom is God's kingdom. Oh, now to be sure, we can frustrate it. We can hinder it. Uh, we can get in his way. Um, but we can also make a situation where, where, where the kingdom is, we can clear the road where the kingdom is given a great opportunity to come fully and speedily. When, a, For instance, when the church begins to pray seriously, God, cleanse our hearts. God, examine us. God, we offer ourselves as instruments. God, we trust you. God, we want to get out of your way. God, we don't, we're not going to insist that you do it our way. God, we, we want to see a work of God that changes our city. When a church does that, that's like clearing the word, clearing the table here. God, however you do, whatever you do, growing your kingdom, Father, we're right here. Here's our hands and feet. Use us, okay? But behind all things is God because God is the power. And behind all things is the will of God. And really, all God asks of us is that we scatter seed, that we tell people about Jesus, that we tell people that Jesus loves them. We tell people that they have a sin problem. And not everybody likes to hear that. But it's the truth. Because that's what the Bible says. And we do it with great compassion because I was one of those people I had a sin problem until Christ saved me. And I'm 60 years old, and I still struggle with the effects of sin. And so followers of Christ can never look down on anybody who is yet to know Christ because we, we realize that we are all recovering sinners by grace. So there is a certain helplessness that we're reminded of in this parable. You know, <laughs> Jesus pretty up front and says, you know, farmer, you go out and scatter seed and then you just go to bed, you get up, you eat breakfast, you know, check your Facebook, check your email, you're going about your life. And the whole time, God's doing something over here in the earth and that's kind of like it is with the kingdom of heaven. We scatter seeds and we just put the gospel out and then God just takes it and he's doing something with it even when we can't see it. And then the second thing this little parable says to us are, um, are some things that Jesus does this on a regular basis. He uses nature, his creation. He uses nature to teach us about the kingdom of God, some things that we need to know and, and remember and, and, and kind of keep in mind as we, we're on our journey uh, with Christ. Um, one of the things I think that Jesus is teaching us here, because he talks about, you know, we go to bed, we get up, we wake up, and, and it starts out and there's just a little green something and then it begins to grow. In, in nature, growth is often imperceptible if you just look from one day to the next. Okay, it's like this. I, some of you might not can relate to this because some of y'all have moved maybe into a place where you no longer cut your own grass, but I cut my own grass. And it's amazing to me how I can look at my grass today. When I finished cutting it, I, I, I cut my grass this past Saturday. I look at it Saturday. I looked at it and said, it's beautiful. Not a leaf out there. I can look at it Sunday and think, oh, it still looks beautiful on Monday. And then I, I kind of stop thinking about it. And then maybe Friday or Saturday or Sunday when we get on into the spring, I'm driving up and all of a sudden I'm like, when did my grass grow? I didn't, I didn't see my grass growing. Well, you don't see it. It's, 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 it's almost imperceptible. It's the passage of time that allows us to see clearly the growth in nature and the same is true in the kingdom of God. I think one of the biggest things that is, is hindering churches and maybe even hindering ours to some degree 
is that we are such a want it now um, society. We're, we're more about the microwave than the crock pot. We, we, want to, we want to do a big event right now that just absolutely changes everything overnight. And God can certainly do that kind of thing. But if you look at the history of the church, the movement of God is more clearly seen as you look at the passage of time, where we are today from where we were 10 years ago or 50 years ago, 100 years ago. As you see the kingdom of God doing its work and upending stuff and customs and, and nations and all kinds of things, nature's growth is, is, sometimes it's imperceptible. And I want to encourage you, okay, if you're a Sunday school teacher, maybe you're a small group leader, uh, maybe you work in some other uh, ministry area, Awana or Vacation Bible School or whatever it might be, uh, student ministry. D don't get discouraged if, 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 if you're having those days where you think, and what I'm doing is, is, is what I'm doing of any value. Because sometimes if we don't see immediate results, we just kind of assume that we're not really accomplishing anything. And, and yet I think in this little parable, we, we see this truth that like, keep going to bed, keep getting up, keep doing what you do, keep spreading the seed. God's at work in it. You're not going to see it right away because a lot of us in the earth, that's where the seed starts. It's out of sight. But something's happening there. Second thing about nature and, and the kingdom of God that I, th I think we can understand is that um, even though it sometimes is, is imperceptible to see the growth of the kingdom, um, that growth is constant, just like nature's growth is constant. I don't know how old I was, but it was long, uh, way longer after I should have known this, but... I, I, I'll, I'll never forget the day when somebody explained to me that even in the winter time, even though you not you don't see your grass growing because on the surface it's brown and, and the, the, the cold weather has killed it, that the roots are growing underneath the ground. Roots are growing year round. Okay, and they're and they're during the winter they're they're going deeper and they're spreading, getting ready for the coming growth season, the visible growth season. Nature is constantly growing. The kingdom is constantly growing. God is calling people to himself through the gospel of his son, Jesus Christ. Okay? It's happening, and we have, to, we, have to, we have to recognize that that growth is going on. We're, our, we are, we're spasmodic, humans are. We get all energized about something, and we jump at it, and we go at it hard for, for a month, for three months, for four or five months. And then we get weary, we get tired, we get burned out. We feel like we're not accomplishing anything, and then we don't do anything. And then we're like, y'all, let's do something. And, 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 we're, and, and, and then we do it for a little while, and then we don't. And, and God's kingdom is not like that. God is at work. God's, God, God is inviting people to be marathoners in the kingdom of God versus sprint artists. He's not looking for people to run the short race. He's looking for those of us who will be faithful to spread the seeds and trust his work in those seeds of the gospel because he's always growing his kingdom. Now, listen to me, church, okay, wherever you are right now. I wish I could see you. I can. I'm going to see these two people right here. Um, sometimes, sometimes the growth of the kingdom is not going to look like it always has. Sometimes the growth of the kingdom is not going to fit with the way we have done it for the last 30 years. Sometimes the kingdom grows in new ways. Okay? And, and we have to recognize, we have to recognize that. It's not about our systems or our forms or, or our, our constitutions. It's about the kingdom. And it's about seeing the power of the Spirit of God at work, calling people to Christ and lives being restored and, 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 and people finding healing in their lives and their relationships and, 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 and seeing the power of the Spirit at work. And I think a lot of times uh, churches want the kingdom to grow, but they want the kingdom to grow according to their plans. And we need to understand God's going to grow his kingdom according to his plans. And the smartest thing a church can do is to constantly be flexible, be open 
to the movement, the working of the kingdom, because it's always growing, it's constant. All right? And then just one other thing real quick from nature. I got that. Is um, nature's growth is inevitable, and so is the growth of the kingdom of God. The growth of the kingdom is sometimes imperceptible, and it's easy to get discouraged if we don't keep that in mind. Um, the growth of the kingdom is constant. Okay, I mean, as always. It's just the new seeds are being planted and, and, and the Spirit's working on them. you got other seeds that are starting to bear fruit for the kingdom. The kingdom is constantly growing. Um, and much like nature, the growth of the kingdom is inevitable. Ideal conditions, less than ideal conditions, don't matter. The growth of the kingdom is coming. I mean, is is always coming. I started to pull some pictures in here tonight just by way of illustration, but then, you know, I decided not to. But if you look around, did you know that a little small tree that starts out as a seed and maybe some concrete gets laid over that seed, but there's there's still in that earth what's needed for that seed to begin to grow. And you know that little sapling of a tree can actually crack the concrete that covers it as it just inevitably just keeps pushing up and keeps pushing up. Sunday morning, if you come to church here, look around in our asphalt parking lot. Look at all the places where the weeds have kind of split through and found the cracks in the asphalt. And, and they just continue to grow. And in the first, what, the annual, was it, the first two or three months we didn't have any services. And so there was no traffic out there in the parking lot. It's like the weeds were taking over. It's like, we're not going to have a parking lot. And we had to come get it sprayed because cars weren't here to keep, you know, keep it down. If you go out west uh, or other places where there are a lot of mountains, you will be amazed at the number of times you can come up, if you're backpacking space, you can come up on what is basically a straight up vertical wall of rock and you'll find a bush or a tree growing right straight out of the side of that vertical wall of rock where it's taking root. Growth is, is inevitable. Nothing can stop the growth of the kingdom. In spite of man's rebellion, in spite of our disobedience, God's work goes forward. It will not be stopped ever, ever. Some of us despair that <laughs> the kingdom of God is being shut down, the kingdom of God is being muzzled, and the, the kingdom of, let me tell you something, the kingdom of God will never stop growing until the final harvest. God will always be at work in the seeds of the gospel that he has invited you and I to spread as we go into all the world. And so, you know, the last thing about this whole, this whole parable is that we're reminded there is a conclusion. There's a completion uh, to this whole process. There's the, the scattering of the seed, and there's that incredible work of God uh, who, who is the source of all life in those seeds and bringing life up. But there is coming a day of harvest. And that's kind of a two-sided coin because in the day of harvest, there is the good, the good fruit that is brought in, and then there is the destruction of the, uh, the weeds, what Scripture calls the tares. And knowing that there's coming a day of harvest, we just, as I close, need to be reminded of these things. Okay, and I want to encourage you with these. All right, number one, we need to be patient. We need to be patient. As we come out of this coronavirus, for instance, we need to be patient with each other, patient with what God's doing and how God's doing it. We need to just plant seeds, scatter seeds. We need to encourage the people that we know are followers of Christ. We need to encourage them where they are, and we need to come along beside them. But we need to be patient, asking God to cultivate in us that which is willing to wait on him, to walk with him, to watch for him to work. Okay? I, I, know, I know probably in some of you who are watching right now, there is the thought of, I can't wait till we can get back to the way it used to be. And I want to tell you, I don't, I don't think that's a great way to be thinking. I think we want to get ahead to the place where God is leading. And if it looks different, we're going to trust God with that. We're just going to, we're just going to walk with him. Okay? Be patient with God. 
I don't, I know I don't need to tell you this, but, but some, sometimes we, we begin to think that we own the church and we don't. We never do. Pastor doesn't own it. Staff doesn't own it. Deacons don't own it. The people who've been members longest don't own it. The church, the church is bought and paid for by God with the blood, the life of his son, Jesus Christ. God has every right to interrupt the way we've always done it, to do it the way he wants it done. One of the hardest things for Christians in general and Baptists specifically to do is to let go of something that God was doing back here and grab a hold to a new work he's doing up here. One of the things you see in churches a lot, and I mean, you can study it yourself, is that once we see God work back here in a particular way, then, then we kind of wait for him to work in that particular way again, even though 40 years have passed and he's never worked in that way since then. Because God is always growing. There's always a freshness and a newness. And a, that's, that's why Jesus, another one of his great parables, maybe I need to follow tonight, next Wednesday night, with the whole new wine, old wineskin thing, you know, about how God works. So we need to be patient with God. And we need to be open and flexible and willing to just be his hands and feet in the growth of his kingdom. We also need to hold on to hope. There's a lot of hope that has been hurt during this coronavirus thing. People who are just absolutely convinced the world's about to end, and it may be about to end. I'm good either way. I know Jesus Christ as my Savior. Somebody planted that seed in my heart, and it bore fruit. I was brought to the cross through those seeds of the gospel. The Holy Spirit used those to bring me to the foot of the cross. But we can't lose hope. We can't despair that God is no longer in control or that God has lost his power or that God's voice has been silenced. That will never happen. There's this thing called the doomsday clock. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not. Okay, it's been around since 1947, I think. And, and so this group of really smart people, supposedly, they kind of look at the conditions of the world, you know, and they take a lot of things into effect, uh, I mean, into account. And... Um, and so they set the doomsday clock to, uh, by way of saying we're this close to the end of the world. These aren't theologians, okay? <laughs> this is not a theological doomsday clock. This is humans thinking they know what's going on clock. And right now, as of January the 27th, 2021, I think that was the date, the doomsday clock is set at 100 seconds before midnight. Midnight being the hour when the whole world ends. When boom, it's all gone. And, you know, I'm like, God must, if God laughs, and I, I think he laughs. I don't know what it sounds like. It sounds like thunder rolling across the heavens. But I, I've got to think that God's in heaven when they're putting out this press release that we're 100 seconds away from the end of all civilization. And God's got to be going, God, you have got to be joking. I'm the only one that knows when that's going to happen. We can't lose hope. Our God's in control. He is always in control. The harvest will not begin until his purposes are completed. And because we believe that God is who he, he says he is, and we believe the things we really believe, the things that we say we believe about God, then we need to be prepared. And there's really only one way to prepare for the harvest. That is to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. There is no other preparation. There are not enough good things you can do to earn your way into the kingdom of God. There is not enough money that you can give to qualify you for sainthood in the kingdom of God. There is no amount of church busyness that you can involve yourself in that will be an acceptable substitute for a surrendered relationship to the Son of God. 
referring to himself, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody's coming to the Father but by me. There, there is no other way to get there. And yes, if you're going to surrender to Jesus, that means you let go of yourself and you grab a hold of Christ. You surrender your agenda to his agenda. You submit to walk under his authority the rest of your days on the face of this earth. And if you really know who Jesus is, that's what you want to do. You don't do it because you got to do it. You do it because how can I not love him back knowing what he did for me? So there you go. Just a little short uh, parable. Says a lot to us about church, church life, what we do, and all this good kind of stuff. And I hope that, uh, I don't hope, I know that God, if, if your heart was open to hear, that God has in some way spoken to you uh, wherever you are in your life. So God bless you. I hope that the rest of your week is great. I hope that um, you experience a fresh presence of God in your life, your relationships, your circumstances. Don't, don't let the news media and the headlines and, and all the stuff going on out here, don't let that shape your heart. Let your heart be shaped by the hope we have in Christ. Slow down. Spend time in his presence. He loves you so very much. And I love you too. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you Sunday morning. We'll be here for worship. And Andrew's trying to decide when to press this button in. And so every time she starts to do her hand up, I start talking some more. And she has to pull her hand back in case you wonder why I keep going on and on. So now that I've called her out on that. It's good to see you here tonight. And, um, Sunday morning will be right here, Sunday school, uh, Sunday morning small groups, 9 o'clock, worship at 10 o'clock in the fellowship hall. And Russell, don't forget to do what Saturday? 7 o'clock back. Yeah. Say clock. Back? Back. Yeah, I'm going to get more sleep. I'm, I'm going to be two hours late. Okay. <laughs> so Russell will not be helping with the broadcast on Sunday morning, but... That's for all of you out there, that's why I'm on this side of the camera. <laughs> you set your clock ahead, okay, so that we're all here together at the same time to worship. God bless them. Say a word of prayer, and we'll, and we'll be done. Father, thank you for our time together tonight. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your, your long-suffering patience with us. Father, thank you that, um, that your love for us is based on who you are and not how well we perform. Thank you for what you're doing, your kingdom that's growing right here around us. Give us eyes to see. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.